Heavenly Father, may I speak in your name. May these words speak deeply into your scriptures and reveal to us something of the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. When, when I preached here last week, I chose not to focus on Paul's letter to the Romans. I felt God had given me a message to share through the parable of the sower. Uh, however, Christopher preached on Romans at uh, Morton Corbett and, uh, and I found myself thinking, oh, maybe I missed a trick there. Um, so I'm going to talk about the passage from Romans today in, in particular. Um, but you know that I like to stress the importance of putting passages in context. And of course, we've just dropped ourselves pretty much in the middle of, of the letter to the Romans. So I'm going to do a quick recap of Paul's letter to the Romans thus far. Uh, this may be teaching some of you stuff that you already know, uh, but if not, I hope you find it as useful as I did to remind myself of all of this. Paul starts out in chapter one of Romans with a formal greeting, including a brief explanation of himself and his mission. He clearly has not visited the church in Rome previously, and he needs to introduce himself to them. He sets out a vision of winning followers, or as he puts it, reaping some harvest among you. In fact, whenever Paul lays out his vision for his own mission and for that of the church, it's always a vision that is reaching out. There is never a sense in Paul's ministry that he is done spreading the news. He's a wonderful example of how seriously we should be taking Jesus' commission to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. And then, in the space of just two verses, he sums up the message of the whole of the 16 chapters that he's about to write. And he says, you need faith. It's only through faith that we receive salvation. Whatever your situation, whether you're a Jewish Christian or a Gentile Christian, what you need is faith. And that's it, that's his two verses. And you wonder why he then goes on to do another 16 chapters, but he does. Uh, he does, of course, then explain it in a lot more detail. And so for the rest of the first eight chapters of Romans, Paul lays out for his audience the gospel, the good news of Jesus. He starts out by explaining the problem, namely that we are all guilty, not just of big sins like murder, but everyday sins like gossip and cheating and causing strife between one another. And all of this guilt is a barrier between us and God. He admits very kindly that some of us have tried our best, either through attempting to follow our conscience or through following Jewish law. But we all fall short of what is right. In fact, Paul makes a point of being very clear that being Jewish is really of no significant advantage. The law has simply served to demonstrate the weakness of human beings. But then having stated the problem, Paul goes on to explain how people can be made right with God. His favourite terms to use are righteousness and justification, but they both boil down to being declared not guilty and to finding those barriers torn down so that we rediscover a full relationship with God. And that righteousness is found in the free gift of Jesus Christ, who took it upon himself to take all the punishments that we should have borne for our sins. And it's through faith in Jesus that we are made right. Famously, Paul uses the example of the patriarch Abraham, who God accepted not because of his good deeds or because he chose to get circumcised when God asked him to, but because he had faith. 
Paul then takes it upon himself to compare Jesus and Adam. Through Adam, the world finds itself infected with sin. Through Jesus Christ, the second Adam, the world is offered a way for that sin to no longer count against us. The world is offered forgiveness to all. But this newfound freedom does not mean that we can carry on as we did before. To put our faith in Jesus means dying to our old selves. It means living with Christ and like Christ. Instead of being slaves to sin, in chapter 6, Paul calls us to become slaves of righteousness. And there's been all sorts of discussion about slaves and slavery in recent months. Um, but I have to admit that going from one form of slavery to another doesn't exactly sound too marvellous to me. But I promise I'll come back to that in a little bit. Of course, being human, we have the nature to fall back into our sinful ways. So in last week's passage from, uh, from Romans, the one that you would have heard if I'd used it, uh, the start of chapter 8, Paul reminds us that God has given us not just Jesus as a gift, but a second gift too. Not content with lavishing Jesus Christ upon us, God pours out his Holy Spirit too. And the more we listen to the Holy Spirit, the more we welcome the Holy Spirit into our lives, the more we allow ourselves to be guided by the Holy Spirit, the more we will find ourselves doing right and following the paths of Jesus. Living by the Spirit is a demonstration of the faith that we are called to have in Jesus Christ. Which leads us to today's passage. And I want you not to get too bogged down in the first few words. Because Paul says, yeah, we're in debt. But we're no longer in debt to sin and flesh. Because he's been, already been talking about the fact that we are slaves to sin. We're in debt to sin. And he says, no, no, we're, we're in debt, but we're not in debt to that. Typical Paul, he starts off with one thing and then he's so excited he's got something else in his brain as well. And he has to talk to you about that. And then that means that he has to come back to the first bit again. And what he does do when he comes back to it, he says, instead, we owe our lives to the God who saves us. And so this is where he returns to this idea of slavery. Because he said, God didn't send the Holy Spirit to enslave us, but to show us that we've been adopted into his family. And I know that it talks about the parable of the wheat and the weeds in the Gospel reading today, but I want to help you think about how that links in to another of Jesus' parables. The idea that the Holy Spirit is sent to show us that we are adopted into the family. Think about the prodigal son. The younger son breaks all the ties with his loving family. Literally, he figuratively builds up barriers between himself and his father. He's, he effectively says to his father, I wish you were dead, I don't want to know you anymore. And then he goes off and he becomes enslaved by the desires of this world and finds himself in debt. And when he returns to the family, he asks to be treated as a servant, as a slave. He says, I know I'm going to need to work for my living. But his loving father casts aside all that the son has done and welcomes him directly back into the family. And we don't know how the prodigal son responds to this welcome, but we might reasonably assume that he realises how gracious his father has been and how much he has been forgiven and therefore he chooses to live the rest of his life doing the best that he can to serve that family as a way of expressing his thanks. Do you see how that fits with what Paul's been laying out in Romans up to this point? Now, I think it's worth noting that Paul doesn't go on to say, 
and therefore everything is super duper rosy so we can sit back and relax until the second coming thank you very much good bye end of end of letter rather he indicates that just like jesus the children of god will not have an easy path and we are called to suffer for the sake of the gospel just as it just as last week's parable of the sower reminded us that satan is still keen to turn away as many people as he can from christ and will sow damage anywhere that he can so does today's gospel passage today's parable of the wheat and the weeds there's this beautiful field of wheat and satan flings as many poisonous seeds in as he possibly can our earthly existence is in a troubled world but in the second half of today's passage from romans paul writes it in large and clear letters that any troubles that we will face in this earthly life are not even worth comparing with the glory that is about to be revealed to us when the kingdom of God comes in all its fullness. So as children of God, we long for that future that has been promised to us, when our redemption and our righteousness are revealed in all their glory by the God who rules over all creation. Paul describes it as us groaning inwardly for redeemed bodies. And creation longs too. You know, we know in Genesis it says God made the world and when he made it he looked upon his finished creation and it was very good. Yet the goodness of God's world has been subjected to fallen human beings which means that creation now waits for the day when the total effect of sin will be done away with and creation will stand forth in all its glory as God intends it to be. So as we look at the world around us, at wars and violence and theft and global warming and loss of good old family values and whatever it is that we look at in the world or look at on the news and we go, it was never like that, was it? We might find ourselves calling out, how long, Lord? How long till you reveal the wonders of the kingdom? But I want to draw your attention to Paul's words in verse 23 today. As he talks about our desire to see God's kingdom come, he says this. He says, we know that the whole creation has been groaning in labour pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have the first fruits. We have the first fruits of the Spirit. Because we have the Holy Spirit, that gift of God, we are already able to see the kingdom of God breaking in around us. This is the crux of what I'm trying to get at today. We, the children of God, have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, not just to guide us and show us how to live, not just to be the little good angel on our shoulder saying, go this way, go that way, do this, do that, but to reveal to us the truth and glory of God's kingdom, to be the comforter who assures us and points us toward the sure and certain hope of redemption. Let me see if I can put it another way for you. I'm short-sighted. If I take my glasses off, you lot become a complete nut of blur. Everything looks messy and uncertain. But when I put my glasses on, my optometrist tells me that I can see with better than 2020 vision. In the same way, I spent a significant part of my younger life trying to work out what Christianity was about. And after a while, I opened my eyes and I was able to say, I've got it. I've got it enough that I can believe. I can believe for myself. And I was able to see something that gave me hope. 
But later on in my journey with God, I invited the Holy Spirit into my life. And I asked him to fill me, I asked God to fill me with the Holy Spirit, and it gave me a whole new perspective on my faith. It was like God had put glasses on my faith. The Spirit showed me things that I would not have been able to see on my own, and my hope became sure and certain. My faith is different. My life in Christ is different because I received the Holy Spirit, because the Spirit showed me so much more. And when I think of seeing so much more, I think, you know when you see something beautiful and you've maybe got friends or family or somebody nearby, an acquaintance even, I wonder what your first instinct is when you see something beautiful that no one else has noticed. I don't know about you, but my first instinct is to say, wow, come see what I've discovered. You know, I think of me sitting at the kitchen table and I can see out the kitchen window. I go, oh, wow, look at the birds on the bird feeder. Wow. And these lot go, turn around and start trying to look out the window too. There's something wonderful about sharing the beauty that I have discovered with other people. And that's even more the case when it's something beautiful in the places that we least expect. Have you ever been walking up like a concrete path or something like that and then you suddenly realise there are cracks in the path and there are beautiful tiny little flowers coming out of the path that don't even belong there. There's no reason for them to be there whatsoever and yet you're walking along this path and there's these beautiful, beautiful... I know Caddy's got an eye for these things. I've seen the photos, Caddy. Caddy spots the beauty in things that nobody else spots the beauty in. It's there. But isn't that true with the world in general? The church exists in a world that contains pain and suffering. And our calling is not to avoid the pain. Part of our calling as the church is to live in and with that suffering and to care for those who are suffering along with us. But if we are a spirit-filled church, then we can see the beauty of creation that is to be. We have that vision in us that says, we know we're heading for something better. We've seen it, we've got that sure and certain hope. And we're starting to live it because we're living like Jesus and therefore we're experiencing more things that are more Christ-like in our lives. And so the other part of our calling is to bring the hope. Our calling is to say to others, to our family, our friends and our communities, come and see what we've discovered. Or as Psalm 34 puts it, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Amen.